This fourth lecture in the series deals with ventricular function assessment. At the completion of this learning module, you should have an understanding of the assessment of left ventricular systolic function, both in terms of global function and segmental analysis, and the assessment of right ventricular systolic function. First of all, the Wiggers diagram at right demonstrates left ventricular events. We will be focusing on the events between the Q wave, which is the onset of systole, and the end of the ejection phase. Global left ventricular systolic function can be assessed in a number of different ways uh, of increasing uh, complexity. Uh, fractional shortening is a linear measurement used to uh, assess how well the left ventricle contracts. Ejection fraction is a three-dimensional uh, volumetric measurement. Uh, it can be derived uh, from linear measurements, as in the Tycholtz method, or it can be derived from a area tracing and uh, assumptions about the geometry of the left ventricle, as in the Simpson's method of discs. Lastly, there's a highly sophisticated method known as the eyeball method, uh, which is purely a visual assessment. First of all, fractional shortening. Um, this is commonly reported on echo reports. It's <coughs> a measurement made in the uh, using M mode, f derived from the parasternal long axis view. At right, you can see a still image, uh, an M mode tracing, uh, parasternal long axis with the dotted line perpendicular to the left ventricular anteroseptum and posterior wall and it's very important that this measurement be taken perpendicular to the walls. It's through the middle of the left ventricle so in other words the uh, line of sight is just at the tips of the mitral valve leaflets and it only pertains to the anteroseptum and the posterior wall. The cavity, left ventricular cavity, is measured in diastole timed from the ECG and at, uh, at end systole, um, maximal anterior excursion of the uh, posterior wall is taken at that, as that point. And it's presented as a percentage. There's a large range of normals from 25 to 44%. The Tycholtz method uses those same linear measurements and mathematically estimates, or rather guesstimates, a percentage volume change. This is only poorly correlated with, uh, with uh, 3D echocardiography or MRI measurements of left ventricular systolic uh, function. And um, if you see a echo report which mentions ejection fraction, Tycholtz method, uh, take the figure with a grain of salt. The Simpsons method traces the endocardial border, or the innermost layer, of the left ventricular cavity, uh, usually in the apical 4 chamber view and at right angles to it, the apical 2 chamber view. The thickness of the discs are known. The uh, length of the ventricle is divided into 20, uh, so the height of each disc is equal and it's 1 20th of the left ventricular uh, apical to basal length and the diameter of each disc is taken from the tracing of the endocardium to that midline uh, long axis of the, the heart. So the left ventricular volume can then be derived as the sum from disc 1 to disc 20 of pi r squared times, uh, times the height of the discs. The ejection fraction is uh, derived from that measurement, uh, that volume measurement uh, obtained in diastole and then in systole and is represented as a percentage. If the measurement is only done in the apical four chamber, then it's known as Simpson's monoplane uh, ejection fraction. If uh, 
an average is used of apical 4 and apical 2 chamber measurements, accounting for the fact that the left ventricle is not perfectly concentric, then it's called a biplane measurement. As you can imagine, this does take uh, a fair bit of time, and the images have to be accurate with a good definition of the endocardial border, so it probably is something beyond the scope of uh, emergent uh, practice in, uh, in our uh, critical care environment. The eyeball method is a numerical guesstimate of uh, ejection fraction, and with increasing experience, uh, echocardiologists can be within 5% of the measured value or it can actually be a qualitative estimate, and I think this is what's most useful for us. It's not too difficult to pick a left ventricle that's normal, nor one which has severely decreased function, and similarly a small volume or hyperdynamic uh, ventricle uh, does tend to stand out. So first eyeball test. What do you think of this left ventricle? Note that you haven't had specific training in global left ventricular systolic function assessment, but most people correctly uh, categorise this as a normal left ventricle. Example number two. Nearly everyone seeing this will say, oh, this is not good. And indeed, this represents a severe dilated cardiomyopathy. Note the centimetre markings along the, the right-hand side. This is severely dilated. And there's really not much happening. One of the telltale signs is the mitral valve is barely puffing open. There's hardly any thickening of the walls. The basal septum's preserved a bit better, but overall this is actually a ventricle with an ejection fraction of 15%. Contrast that to this ventricle. Thick walled, ventricular walls almost kissing. This is a hyperdynamic ventricle. Now, in fact, this particular case is of a uh, hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy. Uh, the patient's also got aortic uh, sclerosis or possibly even stenosis, and um, there's anterior motion of the mitral leaflet, so there's uh, dynamic obstruction occurring. The reason why this picture has been used is that a small volume hyperdynamic heart often does not image well. Uh, a very grainy, small uh, left ventricle that's going very, very fast um, stands out as a problematic ventricle, but um, isn't a particularly good example for, for this course. Now on to segmental dysfunction. This um, does cause a lot of consternation, uh, even between experienced echocardiologists. There's often poor agreement as to the classification of, um, of segmental dysfunction. But we are talking about patients arrested, peri-arrest. We expect gross abnormalities. So rather than looking for the subtleties of hypokinesia, where the uh, thickening of the left ventricular wall is less than 40%, we're really looking for akinetic segments or segments that should be contracting but instead bulge out, uh, aneurysmal or dyskinetic uh, segments. It is possible to analyse all of the segments in multiple views to derive a... Uh, a essentially an angiographic map of where the expected lesion is. This uh, illustration just demonstrates the segmental arterial supply. You can see that from the parasternal short axis, you're imaging the heart in such a way that you can actually pick up a problem with any of the three uh, coronary arteries.
this is an, this is an apical four chamber view. Striking abnormalities that there's almost no thickening of the infraceptum or the apex. There is preservation of the lateral wall. So this represents a large LAD territory infarct. This is a slightly more difficult case. However, looking at the parasternal long axis, the anteroceptum is seen to thicken nicely. But the same can't be said to be true for the posterior wall. We need to ignore the bulk of the uh, papillary muscle when making this analysis. And here on the right in the parasternal short axis, in anteroceptum, anterior wall, lateral wall, all appear to thicken. If you blank out the bottom half of the ventricle, everything from here down to about this point is either akinetic or hypokinetic. So this is a infraposterior infarct. Note that the posterior wall, inferior and posterior walls, are being tugged forwards by the preserved uh, segments. So it is often important to uh, blank out the areas that are working well, put your hand over them so they don't distract. Moving on to the right ventricle, the right ventricle has a very complex uh, geometry. It's not as easy to assess as the uh, largely sort of cone-shaped left ventricle. Uh, it, right ventricle forms a crescent uh, over the uh, antero to right side of the left ventricle and uh, has a definite sort of inflow apical outflow geometry. So that's tricuspid valve, inflow, and then out to pulmonary valve. The contra uh, contraction is more torsional than uh, coming in from the side, so that is also difficult to assess. And assessment has to um, take into multiple views, take into account multiple views. So here from the apical four chamber, we can assess the right ventricle lateral wall, from the subcostal forechamber, the right ventricular free wall, from the parasternal long axis and also short axis, the right ventricular outflow tract. However, to make a summation of all of these and a global assessment can be quite difficult. That's why sometimes surrogate markers are used. Um, one can measure the longitudinal function, so how well the right ventricle is able to pull the tricuspid valve up towards the apex, so-called tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion, as a surrogate measure of right ventricular function. So this is the M-mode tracing that would be taken uh, using a line of sight that goes through the tricuspid annulus, and uh, here you can see a tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion of 29 millimetres. Above 25 is normal, below 15 is abnormal right ventricular function. Here is an example of a right ventricle that is not doing well. Right ventricular failure uh, manifests as decreased tricuspid annular plane excursion. So even though this valve is being pulled up towards the apex, it's not being pulled up by one and a half centimetres. The chamber dilates, the right ventricular chamber works at lower pressures. Any volume load or pressure load on the right ventricle results in dilatation. Usually the right ventricle should be 0.6 of the diameter of the left ventricle at the, uh, at the valvular annulus. And what this particular example uh, demonstrates is paradoxical septal movement and it appears to be contracting together with the lateral wall of the right ventricle. Uh, that's unusual. Usually the septum will be working with the left ventricle. So the following 
uh, have been described. Uh, global assessment of left ventricular systolic function, segmental assessment, and assessment of right ventricular.